They caved my head in with a pipe and beat me for several hours. But as I lay there half conscious, with my nuts exposed to air, I looked up to the blackened sky and said an ancient prayer. Lord, if you're there, please infuse my nuts with the power of a thousand suns. Holy shit, you're real? Let there be thunder!
Are, are we live? Yes, sir, we are live! Hello, hello, everybody, and welcome to an exciting Saturday stream. Today, we've got a bit of story time and maybe a few other options ahead of us, but we will get to that when we get there. For now, I simply want to say hello. How have all y'all's weeks been? How are your weekends shaping up? And who's getting ready for Tuesday? Natani Great Ascends! Is it 5 p.m. or a.m. for Eric? For Eric, it is currently 5 p.m. I'm about 23 hours ahead, it seems. Is it Monday for you? Or Sunday? Ah, Vulcan, are you on Sunday talk already? Because goddamn, I do not even want to imagine what'll happen if you show up for our fucking 12-hour stream. That is going to be a very interesting day. So who all do we have out there? We seem to be a little light on our introduction today, but I'm seeing Sphinx and Vulcan hanging around. I know how Frost and Crazy had to head out, but how's everyone else doing? How have your weeks, days, weekends, plans? Everything. Everything that's going on. How has that been going? Any new exciting news or strange occurrences? Or, I suppose, any big questions for the upcoming subathon event? I know there's been some chat going on, but I don't know if everybody currently here has been hearing a ton about it. For those who are joining late or haven't been keeping up with the news, on Tuesday the 23rd, I'm going to be having my own little channel subathon where we will have a lot of milestones working our way up to 210 subs. Every 10 subs or so, we're going to be extending the stream by an hour. And you all will be getting the opportunity to choose what I do next. We have a selection of games ranging from Dark Souls to Dead Space to Satisfactory to mtg arena and some other activities including designing costumes designing emotes or me doing dramatic readings of whatever you all provide something i am filled with absolute terror of building our way up to our grand finale at 210 subs i will be streaming a dnd &D session with some members of chat. That's right, I have been working on building up a dungeon to run chat through. But that dungeon has quite a bit of history. Because this will actually be the fourth time ever I've run people through a version of the dungeon. And today, depending on how our people feeling, we might spend a portion of our time, instead of doing story time, talking about the story of Natharak's tomb. Seeing where inspirations came from, how it was created in its first rendition, and how that context has built it into what I am making for the final time. I wish last was here. I wish last week is a chosen three day week. <laughs> Don't we wish that for every week? Yep. No. Let's let's just all agree. Weeks are now only three days. Weekends are four. I don't know if I'd be able to pay my bills going that way, but I'd certainly appreciate all the time off. Though I might end up just spending a lot of that time streaming out to all y'all. Ah, uh, good evening, Mortis. How are you doing? Welcome, welcome. So then, I guess today 
with a little bit of a light intro, as is customary with my D&D streams, perhaps I will let you all decide what you would like to do. Bring on four 10-hour days instead of that awkward five eight-hour days? I don't know, man. Like, I understand having an extra day off would feel great, but oof, having to stay at work so much longer. Uh, just saying hi, we're still playing our D&D game. Have a good stream. Okay, Terramon, you go have fun there. So then, for the people who are sticking around and hanging out, I have a very important question for you. Today, I have planned a little bit of a story time, as is, oh, there we go, tradition. However... We also could spend a chunk or all of today talking about the dungeon I have called the Tomb of Natharak, or Natharak's Tomb. He's not a very stable person, so namings sometimes become twisted. In all honesty, I'm missing the overtime I used to get. 12-hour OT was so nice for my savings. I can 100% understand that, Waka. I don't know. I think, I think I'm definitely on a little bit of the other side of that spectrum where I might, I might be willing to accept that, that not getting paid is great for having, like, more PTO, more time off, but, you know, that's only because I know I'm making enough to be always at least hitting my bills on the head. Not sure what happens when something unexpected comes around, but... Oh, roasty, toasty, tardy, great stream. Well, would you like me to move the fire for now until we decide what we're doing? Because I don't mind. Let's well, just... Big fire, get rid of little fire. There we go. Now, roasty, toasty, everyone. So, then... I suppose... That is the question for those who hang, are hanging around. And I'll put up a poll in a minute to see what you all feel. But today we have, I suppose, four basic options. We could spend all day <laughs> talking about my story. Doing the recap, going through a nice long hour and a half story time get ourselves really ingrained with the tale of the party we could instead split our time spend half of today doing story time meaning we won't get as far as we might like but spend the other half telling you the tale of natharak's tomb its original versions its history and how i have written it to fit into different settings and the final option is a deep dive into Natharak's tomb, where I will basically be spending all of today's stream talking about this long, old dungeon that I made, talking a bit about building it in pen and paper, why I made it the way I did, the character I made for it, and a bit of discussion of the very first setting I put it into, and how it was meant to fit there, before talking about what elements of that campaign I decided to carry over into my latest version. All I think are very interesting options. I suspect there's an interest in getting as much information as possible. But that is what we are deciding now, with a little poll on what shall we discuss today would you like a full story time a full dive into the dungeon or split half story half two I'll put up a nice two-minute poll for you all, and we can go ahead and get voting. I've never played an actual D&D module. A bunch of one-shots and custom campaigns, though. Yeah, honestly, Sphinx, I've never played a uh, module myself. 
I tend to design my one shots, I think, as modules, because I've almost never had a one shot actually only last a single session. They tend to go two or three, but that's just sort of how I build things, I think. So now the poll is up, where we will decide what today's schedule looks like. Right. I'll probably bounce once talk of the dungeon starts. If I end up being part of the group, I'd prefer to keep as much of the dungeon a surprise. Well, don't worry, Waco. The dungeon's actual contents has changed drastically between versions, and I imagine in this latest one it'll change again. This is more so looking at the history of me building this and how I have made it to fit into multiple settings. And just a little bit of talking about what I like to do when I build a dungeon. Though you are free to keep as much of it secret as possible. Well then, we've got a few votes coming in. We'll see how everyone feels. Though I suspect I'm seeing where people are leaning already. Ah, uh, yes. Well then. Just a few seconds left to vote for your preference. Try and tilt things to the stream you would like to see. I'm going to play a module on Friday. Oh, do you know what module, Mortis? And do you know kind of the scale of it? Kind of one of those big things like uh, Avernus or... So we're doing a half and half stream today. Hell yeah. Like, uh, what is it? Avernus or... Um... Oh god, what is Ravenloft? Uh, I, I'm not remembering the actual name of that, but... There's like, what are those, like campaign modules? And then there's like one-shot modules that are just... Oh, Curse of Strahd. No idea what it is. Yeah, Curse of Strahd. Going to Ravenloft. Wow. I hope you have fun with that. That is a fun one to go into, especially when you don't know anything of what's happening. But... It is a very dark and dreary world. I hope your DM is able to fully capture it. Now then. Now then, now then, now then. That could be pretty helpful, actually. Here in that perspective, then, I'll be wanting to run a game for my group since almost everyone in it has run something before, but the prep for it has been daunting, even for a one shot. I entirely understand that, Walker. So today, we'll be starting off with the first half of our stream being, uh, how did you get up there? You got a little off-center, didn't you, chat? There we go, that should be a bit better. So today, we'll start with the first half being just a bit of story time. And once story time is done and out of the way, then we can delve into the tomb. Of Nathara. So, with that, I suppose we'll move back to the small plot. After all, it seems everyone likes to take a look at the map. Here we are. Here we find our party at the top floor of the Gretton Manor. Well, before we get there, I suppose we will need a bit of a recap, you know? Why our party is here. What happened along the way is so that we can better be prepared for what comes next. The party had accepted a job from the tradesman Galadarera Ertama, and from him they had traveled to the noble district of the city of Aten, meeting a man named Frederick Ever, brother to the king, uncle to the prince of this kingdom. It seems he has been working hard to create 
diplomatic relations with neighboring kingdoms and have repaired a marriage between a princess and the young prince Ivan. But the boy was caught up in romance of his age. And so the uncle required for the party to find out who his infatuation was with so that he might properly break it off and prepare the boy to serve his duty. Talking with Ivan Teber, the party found out who he was interested in. A girl, a woman of noble birth, named Rosalind Gretton. Her family apparently had had a dark past. And so to find out more, the party spoke with her brother, a knight in training, Fox Gretton. Talking with him, they learned that long ago, the manor of the Gretton family was abandoned. It seems their great uncle, leader of the household, had descended into a madness, experimenting with magic and developing a process to make highly flexible automatons, servants for the household that could understand more complex orders than any other magical servant or construction. However, one evening, these creatures would go room by room in the manor, killing the entire family, except for the two children, Hawks and Rosalind, who barely escaped with their lives and had not been back in over ten years. Hearing this, the party made an arrangement with Hawks that they would go to the manor and to clear it out for his family in exchange for a bit of gold and for information about the rooms there. After all, the party was still divided on how they wished to approach the prince. He had given them his love story and had asked them to go to the manor and retrieve Rosalind's lost doll, a stuffed rabbit which they now have in hand so that he might have them presented to her with a letter declaring his love. Frederick would prefer that the boy not declare his romantic feelings. After all, he must be married to Princess Katarina. And the party is still going back and forth about how they wish to end this. But with monsters in front of them and pay offered by the night, they decide to put those questions aside for a time. They would go into the manor and fight their way through several suits of armor before arriving at the manor's drinking room. Here they would begin to learn a bit about the automatons here. As a barman machine behind a station, would offer them drinks and only react as they would try to leave the room with items that he had not given them. It seems he knows what is his domain and will quickly react should anything in it be despoiled. However, as the party pushed into the next room, they would meet a much more insidious creation. A painting seemingly alive, or at least the girl in the painting alive, would cast a crown of madness upon Perch, causing him to see visions of a strange vulpine shifter taunting him. Trapped by the madness of the spell, Perch would begin attacking his party members before running to create as much distance between him and them as possible. He and Malachite would find themselves back in the drinking room engaging in a fist fight until Perch was beaten down to tears. In the ballroom, Valandria and Pharaoh would be working frantically to burn or destroy all of the paintings that the little girl seemed to dance between, laughing the whole way, until eventually they would see it destroyed. Searching the rest of the bottom floor, they would find the last few suits within the kitchen, seemingly on standby, 
waiting for something. Deciding it'd be better to check the place for any other surprises before they try to fight these last armors. The party headed upstairs and began searching the many rooms of the manor before finally finding the old stuffed doll of Rosalind Gretton and then finding their way into the room of the master of the house. And here they would find journals, notes, and half-finished servants, thus allowing a story to be told. The great uncle, it seems, had gone mad in a sense, trying to discover a new way to use magic to make the perfect servant. But all his self-study and searches came up blank until he went off on a trip for nearly half a year when he came back it would seem that he had received what he was looking for and began manufacturing these new and improved servants but as each new creation came it seemed his mind descended further and further into a habitual madness until it seems the day the suits of armor killed the entire family. Within the bedroom, the party would find what seemed to be the dead figure of the great uncle curled into a fetal position on the bed, skeletal, in taunt and rotting in places dry husk a man clearly dead for years but as they would roll the corpse over they would find his eyes to be still very much alive roiling in the sockets twisting that way and this as if seeing horrors as if seeing the party veined in dark green Lines similar to the sigils on the suits of armor, the eyes would continue looking about the room, twitching as if in REM, until the party would put the man out of his misery and watch the eyes roll from their sockets, bounce upon the floor, and stare upwards. Taking a moment, Pharaoh and Malachite would leave the room, leaving only Valandria and Perch to deal with the eyes. The first Perch would destroy by throwing it against the wall. As he picked up the second, and began to crush it. A voice would appear in the back of his mind. An old woman's voice, strange, mysterious intelligent hello there i would appreciate it if you not do that again perch and the shifter figure he had seen in his madness but have a discussion with this old woman she would explain that she had worked hard to create these eyes from the fool in the bed. She had taught him how to make the magic he wished to use, and warned him that with each use it would drain from him his wisdom permanently. And that the man foolishly kept building, till eventually he cast himself into an internal prison within the nightmare realm. In that permanent, undying torture, his eyes would marinate in that mysterious evil. And now this woman wished to have the eyes returned to her. With one destroyed already, she offered Perch something in exchange for bringing the other back. An answer to a question he had held for a long time. What is he? 
As Perch considered the offer, he felt all the emotions of the day rushing back to him. The crown of madness attacking his friends, the fear, the confusion. It was too much to process all of this at once. And so, Perch asked the hag a moment to think. And she granted it to him, allowing him egress from the mental plane on which he spoke with her. Back in the real world, Perch would be faced with this question. To deliver that mysterious figure, this dark object she had created through the suffering of this man, and receive the answers he had spent his life searching for. Or not. His wounds were too fresh, his nerves too raw to think. And so he handed the eye to the laundry. Aren't you going to destroy it, Perch? I. I can't right now. I. I can't make the decision right now. I'm just too. I need time to think on this. Don't destroy this, but I think you should hold it for now. With that, Perch released the eye into Valandria's hand and begun to step away. But as the eye landed in her paw, it wheeled about and stared up at her face as Valandria heard a voice in the back of her mind. Well, hello to you. What is your name, dearie? Oh, now this mind is far more lonely, isn't it? And as Valandria is pulled into the figure's mind state, that is where we left off our last stream. The eye handed over a voice speaking to Valandria now, and Perch, wanting answers, but uncertain if he can trust the source. With that, we are caught. Oh, we are recap, and we are prepared to delve deep into story for today. But before that, I simply wish to ask, how are you all doing? Are you feeling excited or ready for today's story time? Do you have any questions before we get into it? Anything you wish to have clarified or anything you are wondering things you must know before we push on ahead now is your time to ask but i'm going to need just a moment i uh, forgot to have anything to drink and if i'm going to be doing a story time i'm definitely going to need to wet my whistle so if you'll excuse me for just one moment i'll be back Answer any questions you have, and then we can begin. There we are. I keep thinking Juniper's the bird in the character portrait. Then I look at the screen. Wow. Juniper does actually play that bird, interestingly enough, Vulcan. 
That is a good catch, actually. Juniper is a member of my uh, current campaign, the story we are telling, and she plays the Aarakocra cleric known as Pharaoh. In fact, Perch, for anybody who's familiar with some of the other people, is actually played by Milkblade, our friendly neighborhood speed-running bionicle boy. It's no wonder he decided to play a Warforged, is all I can say about that. Oh, fun stuff. I thought she was a goblin. Ah, uh, the goblin-looking character. <laughs> No, so that's Malachite, who's a Genasi, played by another friend of mine, but not one who streams. But no, 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 in this campaign, Juniper is playing a, uh, Aarakocra. A very terrifying one at times, too. As clerics of less-than-good gods tend to be. Now then, now then, now then, with our drinks prepared, with our questions answered, with ourselves recaptured by the story, perhaps. It is time to begin. Now, what is your name, my dear? Ah, oh, this mind is far more lonely than the last one, isn't it? Hello, says Valandria. A voice in her mind is not a regular occurrence for her, unlike certain other party members. Looking about, Alondria finds herself in a strange, dark silhouette of a forest, not entirely material, nor entirely imagined. Eyes between the trees, veined in glowing green magic, stare back at her. My name is Velondria. And who are you? Oh, well, it is nice to meet you, Velondria. It's been quite a while since I've met one of such... Inherent magical abilities. Why are you holding on to my eye? Your eye? Valandria asks, looking down at the object in her hand. Yes, that. Has your friend not told you about our deal? You made a deal with him? That is right. He agreed to bring my eye home. But now that you're holding it, perhaps my deal should be with you. Belandria's eyes narrow as she stares about in this dark, silhouetted place. Something feels off here. Unnatural. And yet roiling with life. She realizes now that this magic is similar to those sigils on the suits of armor. You were the one who did this to this family. That's not quite right. That man made his own choices, didn't think of the consequences, and overused himself. What happened? was entirely his own fault. It is what would happen to me for making deals with you be my fault as well. Of course not, dearie. 
Not if you bring me back that little item. What would you offer then? Melandria states, looking at the eye in her hand. Well, they are at the end. Offered your friend answers to any question I might be able. For you, you are a curious one, aren't you? I would of course offer you answers if you would like. But I think you might be interested in secretive magics. Old magics. Things you could not learn anywhere else. Bring me my eye. And it can be yours. Belandria thinks about her decades studying magic at the college on her own. The lessons from her mother her teachers, her mentor, and the voice, what it offers. And she thinks of the manner, the slaughter that happened here, the state of the man who began it. Looking down at this object in her hand, only one word occurs to her. Cursed. A truly horrible, evil item. And if it is so desired by this woman who would lead to its creation, then this voice is also cursed. With that, Valandria smiles, a proud smile, a certain smile. I've got a better offer for you, she says, as her hand slowly tilts and the eye rolls from it, falling, falling. Valandria is not sure. When the voice began screaming at her, whether it was from the moment the eye left her hand, after a moment of it falling to the ground, or as Valandria began to lift her foot. But she knew it was screaming before her foot had fallen, crushing the eye beneath it. And her mind, that scream, of anger, vindiction, rage, formed into words. You, Valandria, do not know who you have angered. I will have recompense from you, one way or another. And as the eye was crushed, and the screams of that woman faded as the dark forest disappeared and the room returned. A new voice screaming replaced the old as Perch marched toward Valandria. What did you do? He says, looking at the destroyed eye beneath her foot. Listen, I spoke with her and- Why did you do that? Perch yelled. I asked you not to. I said I couldn't decide yet. She was going to help me. You could not trust her, Perch. She was evil. She was clearly- With that, Perch's arm flies forward, grabbing Valandria by the neck as he bellowed again at her. You! You, then- or give me the answers. What? Valandria states. They both turn as the door behind them opens, as Pharaoh and Malachite come running in to the sounds of the yelling. 
Birch releases Valandria, turning his back on her, tilting his head around, an anger behind his helmet. You cost me the answers I've spent my life looking for. You better pray that you can give them to me. And with that, Birch marched from the room, leaving a stunned Valandria standing there as Pharaoh and Malachite tried to get answers from her. It would be several minutes before the party would regather in the hallway. Silence, anger, and judgment, palpable in the air. With only one place to check, they would cross the hall to the last room on the second floor. And inside, they would find an old, abandoned library. No servant here to maintain it. It has become overgrown with cobwebs. It's many books falling apart, nearly to dust being forgotten. Alondria would spend some time here, trying to capture her own emotions, as Perch remained out in the hall, standing guard unable to look at her for a time. Between the stacks, Valandria would search for anything to distract her mind. Anything at all. Then she would find a tome. A strange book wrapped in thick treated leather. Opening it, she would find the parchment dried the ink wearing away, leaving almost nothing left. But, flipping through the few pages that still remained, it would become obvious what this was. An old spell book, possessing two spells Rolandria did not know. One called Tiny Servants, the other Dragon's Breath. Valandria would take this book and place it into her bag and stand and join the rest of the party out in the hall. There they would silently gather and begin heading downstairs. And here, in the main hall, they would look about. Well, the laundry says, We did promise to kill all of the suits of armor that were left, yes? Should they still be working, Pharaoh say, if we killed the man who was powering them? Maybe, maybe not. But still, I think we should um, make sure, yes? Malachite would look about and say, Well, there are three upstairs, four in the kitchens, and one in the bar. How best should we do this? In a rough grumble, Birch would state, Let's find a place that they can only come from one or two sides. Get ourselves in a corner, force him into a choke, and try to pick off one as quickly as possible. All right, then I think I know where we should set up. With that, the party would set themselves up in the drinking room. Perch and Malachite would set near the two doors and begin dragging objects in front of them, barricading them, buying themselves time. Once the doors were barricaded, they would approach the now neutral automaton, the bartender. The plan was simple. Attack the automaton and try to kill it as quick as possible. 
With it being attacked, it, was pos it is possible it'll put up a call to the rest of the house, causing all of the suits to come down and attack them. If not, they would unbarricade the door and move to the next room. If luck was on their side, they could destroy these suits one at a time. If not, they would be in the perfect fortified position to deal with them. And so, the fight began. In an instant, all four party members would attack the bartending armor, striking him, throwing spells. But as the firebolt would leave Valandria's hand and strike the suit, the very magic of it would seem to be absorbed. And as the light would ignite in his chest, the bartender would look about at the three of them and exhale a gout of fire across the entire party as they heard a low tone come out from its hollow interior. And then heavy footsteps would fill the entire manor. It seems now is the final time to fight. With a couch ignited by the gout of the bartender's flame, Valandria would peel from combat and start using control fire to bring the flames under control. After all, it would be horrific for the entire place to be engulfed in flames after they had worked so hard to clear it of the danger. As the party would begin focusing their attacks onto this suit of armor, tearing into it, they would eventually bring it to silence, just as the door that they had barricaded would begin to be pounded against as the kitchen staff arrived and barreled their way into the room. With all of them pushing in, Perch would move with Malachite to stop them off, trying to create as much of a choke point as possible. But as they would stand there, it would seem the main kitchen staff member, the chef servant, would too unleash a gout of flame across the party, burning Perch and Malachite terribly. Pharaoh would quickly move up to begin healing them, as Valandria would peel off to the side, using all of her magical abilities to try and control the fire that was now beginning to spread across the bookshelves and couches. One by one, the minor suits of armor would be carved apart. And then, Valandria would rejoin into the efforts, throwing in her own attacks and spells, which would make short work of everything save the main chef, the last of the servants. Fighting with him would be more and more brutal, and in that time, having been truly hurt already, Perch would find himself being knocked unconscious with a blow. Malachite would nearly join him as Pharaoh's spiritual weapon, a dagger of ritualistic intent would fly between the gaps in the suit's armor and find its sigil at the back of its helmet, silencing it forever. With the final suit dead, with the lord of the manor freed, with eyes destroyed, a tall collected, the spell book taken, as prophet. The party would look about at the scorched room of the horrors this manor held, and quietly they would depart. Along the road, back to Autumn, the party would travel. Halfway returning home, the discussion would finally come up about what they will do next. So we have the doll, Melandria states. Also, we have uh, saved the mana for Hawks, so what do we want to do? 
I don't really know, Malachite states. I guess I don't really care if we help Ivan or help Frederick, but we kind of got to help Frederick if we want to get in with Gala, don't we? It was his magic shit we were after in the first place. That is... Who? Melandria says. Though I... Be strange to be setting out someone's love for that. What would you rather do? Perch stated, an evil eye glancing towards them. Well, a while ago I said I would like to hear Rosalind's opinion on all this. We're doing all this without even seeing what she wants, and as perhaps the only member of this love circle or whatever, but is on even footing with Ivan. Perhaps we should see what she wants. Hmm. With that, the party would agree to visit the current Gretton household within the city of Auten to meet with Rosalind and find out what she wished. The party would travel all the way back to the city and find themselves walking up the roadways towards the strange little home of the Gretton family, a gift to them by the royals of Taverfi after the unfortunate fall of their family. Arriving outside the door, Malachite would cross up the stairs and begin knocking. As she would come back down the stairs and join the party, she would turn to the Laundria. So wait, how are we presenting ourselves? What do you mean? Like, are we saying we're here working for Ivan or Frederick? Or why should we care about who's courting her? In a moment of silence, the whole party would turn towards Malachite and realize... They are a, a strange group of adventurers who had never met Rosalind before. Here to find out who she likes between the people who have been courting her. And just as that realization begins to dawn, the laundry estates. Uh, maybe we should leave and come up with a, uh, an actual plan. You're right. I don't think the door opens as a servant steps out onto the landing. Hello, what could I do for uh, you all? Slowly, the party would turn from their discussion towards the servant standing at the doorway, looking at this strange group of well-singed adventurers. And ever willing to be fast and into the action, Malachite would speak up. We're here to talk to Rosalind. And the forehead slap from Valandria could have been heard clear across the world in response to that. Oh, may I ask what business you have with the lady of the house? Um, Malachite states, looking around for any support from her party members, though all of them seem to be avoiding eye contact with her for some reason. Yeah. We're a singing telegram. What? Yeah, we're here to sing a song for the lady. Um, if you don't want to get her, I guess we could sing it for you. Uh, hi there, Rosalind. We're here to see if you were so That's quite all right, madam, please. That Malachite would fall silent and begin smiling up at the woman. I'll, um, please wait here and I'll go get the lady of the house. 
That would be great. We'll sing for her. Quite, says the servant woman, as she closes the door and disappears into the household. Oh, my God, Malachite. What? What have you done? Well, I don't know. It seems like she's going to go get the lady. It's, for, it's what we wanted, right? We're going to talk to Rosalind now. Oh, yep. We're just a group of singing messengers. Oh, goody. All right. Minutes would pass. And then the party would hear the door opening again. Inside would be a woman, human, in her early to mid-twenties, sporting bright strawberry blonde hair and a fine dress of the nobility of Tverfian. Hello? I've heard that you are wishing to deliver a message to me. Ah, uh, quite, the laundry estates. Um, well, you see, we have a singing message, Malachite states. Hi there! With that, Malachite feels the top of her head get cuffed by Melandria, causing her to grow quiet. Perhaps this is uh, a better of a discussion to have uh, not on the streets? Melandria states, looking pleadingly at the Lady Rosalind. Very well. With that, the party would be invited into the home and brought to a sitting room where a pair of servants would bring out tea for all of them to enjoy. It would take several minutes of explanation and coercion for the party to convince Malachite to stop trying to sing and to explain that they were here to have a very important talk with Rosalind. The truth is, my dear, Landria would state, is that we have been hired by people at the castle, people who are very concerned about recent events, and we are hoping to keep things from escalating to an unnecessary level. Are you aware of all of the people who seek your hand in courtship? The conversation would continue as Valandria would take lead in slowly revealing certain details. They had been speaking with many people at the castle and had learned a bit about Rosalind, that she had many suitors after her, and that some of them communicated entirely through letters. Eventually, Rosalind would explain that she had two major suitors. One the party would figure out was Gregory, a knight in training working with her brother. The other, Rosalind would be very hesitant to give information on until the party let her know that they were aware that Ivan Tever had been sending her poetry and the like. We simply wish to know, uh, Rosalind, before we continue with what we've been hired to do. Do you like Ivan? Do you appreciate his courtship? Do you have feelings for him? Rosalind would grow quiet for a moment, contemplative, thinking. If I can be honest with you all, I'm not really sure how I feel of Ivan. He was a good friend growing up, and he's not a bad person. I don't know if I could say I love him, of course, but I cannot deny that there are many reasons for me to pursue a relationship with the first prince 
of the kingdom. The most important among them is that there is someone I very much care for. That's I wish to protect. Someone that's without any connection to the royal family, I fear will be in danger. What do you mean? Oh, it's nothing like threats or anything like that. It's simply the power that can be wielded that way can protect them. party would begin having a few whispers between themselves. How best to figure out the answer here? Well, the truth is, my dear, is that we are meant to find an end to the relationship between you and Ivan. And the person we're working for can maybe provide something, but I won't break it off, Roslyn says. Not unless you could convince Ivan to do something for me. What would that be? As the first prince, Ivan was granted a very powerful weapon sort of relic of the Teva family. He's not a soldier, not a knight, not someone who will have to fight. So, if you could convince him to give me that sword as a suitor gift or something like that, then I will promise you I will tell him that I don't love him. I'll end it, so that you can have what you want. But I need that weapon, so that it can protect the ones I love. With that, the party would give acquiescence. Give their apologies for interrupting her evening, and head out onto the street. You know what I just realized? Malachite said. What is that, Malachite? This is really awkward. Yes, but is it, Malachite? Malachite would dig into her bag and pull out the stuffed rabbit. I entirely forgot to give this to her. But we're not giving it to her yet, so I guess not. Yeah, well, we're not giving it to Ivan, right? We're trying to set him up to fail. Yes, I... Suppose so. With that, Melandria turns and looks back at the house. At their awkward entrance, the awkward conversation, and their awkward exit. Um, perhaps we'll give it to her brother when we speak with him. What might make everything just a little less weird, yes? All right, Malachite says, placing the toy away into our bag. In fact, how about we go talk to him now and get the simple part of this job done and out of the way. Agreed. With that, the party would cross through the city of Otten, finding the training yard, where Hawks and Gregor seem to be engaging in a relaxing break from their duels. Approaching the pair, the party would explain how they had cleared out the house and made sure that his great-uncle had been put to rest. With that, he would offer the party gold, and Malachite would produce from her bag a stuffed rabbit. Also, we found this in, in a room there. You should probably have this, Malachite says. <laughs> and why did you grab this, little lady Malachite? As Hawks. The armored knight speaks to her. Malachite feels herself blushing a bit at being called Lady Malachite. I just saw it and thought it might be, you know, yours or your sister's. Or... Uh, this is my sister's. 
Thank you very much for giving it to me. I wonder if she still remembers this thing. As Hawks looks at the doll, Gregor stands up and begins challenging the man, asking him for a duel over the doll so that he might return it to uh, Hawks' sister as a form of courtship. But Hawks would refuse, stating that it was their family and so his job. As the two continued their banter, the party would find themselves leaving and returning towards the district center to speak with Frederick Teffer. Once inside his office, the party would explain what they had found out, that Rosalind would be willing to break it off. But that, she said, that Ivan has some sort of weapon, something from the Teva family. Ish. A very important relic to us, always given to the first prince as a sign of power and our royal name. Well, she agreed to break off anything with Ivan, tell him she never loved him and the whole nine yards. But you see, she wanted that in exchange for the weapon. Frederick would fall silent, weighing a family heirloom, a powerful weapon, but only a sword at the end of the day, against the prince agreeing to marry the princess of an allied kingdom. That sword has been in our family for three generations. It is a powerful relic and important to us. But with our war to a throne, we're going to need more than one sword. I'll arrange for the boy to take these to her as a sign of his love. And if everything goes as you have said, I will uh, provide uh, your friend Gala with all of the trade permissions he could want. Thank you for finding this out and finding a way to resolve this somewhat peacefully. With that, the party would leave from the castle, leave from the tale of Ivan's love, at least for a time, having set the boy up for failure. The next morning, they would not know it, but Ivan, through permission of his uncle, would be finally allowed to leave to declare his feelings for Rosalind Gretchen. He would bring with him an heirloom of his family, a sword, seemingly made of gold along its handle, a weapon enchanted by magics that would make it harder and sharper than any other weapon. It was rumored to even be able to ignite in flames. As Ivan Tether would present this gift to the Lady Rosalind, though, she would accept it with regret, informing Ivan that she did not wish to begin a relationship with him, that she did not wish to marry him. Leaving the boy heartbroken as he would return to the castle, as his uncle would explain that he was sorry, but the boy should look forward to his duty. That a letter was being sent off to the kingdom of Pont V, and that they would await the response from the princess Katarina. And perhaps he might find love there instead. The evening after this event would happen, none would see what would happen 
in the bedroom of Rosalind Gretton. As she heard the front door open, she would head out and greet her brother returning, soaked in sweat as he removed his armor with the help of a pair of servants. You back, brother. How was uh, your day? It was tough, said Hawk Scratton. And I have finally received my posting. They're going to send me along the western front. It seems I'm to be put into the thick of the fighting within about a month's time. Rosalind would feel fear in that moment. Her brother was the last remaining member of her family and had been the person who had looked after her and who she had looked after ever since the death of the Gretton name. Once he had fully been returned to normal clothing and about to relax for the evening, he would find his sister asking him to join her as she had gotten a going away gift for him. Something she said should protect them on the battlefield, should make sure that their family is protected, and should help him survive his deployment into the war. In her room, Hawks would see on the bed a powerful weapon, a golden longsword, clearly enchanted with great magic. Fox would find himself silent, a thousand questions running through his mind. Where did his sister get this? How expensive was it, or what did she give away? And why does it represent the blade of the Tether family? But as he looked at the blade and looked at his sister, he saw the fear of him disappearing like the rest of their family, killed by the mindless machine of war. And he did not ask her any of these questions. He simply grabbed the blade and tied it to his belt. Thank you, sister. I'll make sure to survive. With that, I believe we are at a good halfway point in our evening that we might swap over to discussing the tomb of Nafara. I do apologize if people were just getting excited or emotional about that story, but it's not every day I get to tell people what happened as a result of their quest. That's a little something that my party actually wouldn't find out for several sessions later when they would meet up with Hawks again and find the golden blade at his hip. If any of you are curious, the party had a big theory going that Rosalind actually was in love with Gregory and wished to give him the blade as a sign of her courtship of him. But no, unfortunately, she simply cared deeply about her brother's safety. As the last two members of their family, and as he was the one that saved her from the machines at the manor, she simply wanted to make sure her brother was as protected as possible. But, 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 with that all aside... We could take a bit of a breather, a bit of a relaxation. As we move ourselves into a much less serious, though perhaps more in-depth discussion of a little tune that I have made multiple times over my time DMing Dungeons and Dragons. Something that I made back when I only played in pen and paper within the first few months of me starting up Dungeons and Dragons 4th edition. That's right, 4th edition. <laughs> oh, hey, Lotus Flower! 
Uh, nice. Indeed. Very nice. So, unfortunately, I cannot show you all the actual very first edition of this tomb. When I had first made it, it had just been for basically the second time I had ever played D&D. &D. The second time I had DM'd for a group where just gotten three friends together and they all just rolled up characters and I was just going to make a dungeon for them to go through. So, you know, I drew straight lined walls and, you know, let's see if I can sort of capture the feeling of this. So I simply drew a room that I knew would be a throne room with a uh, locked door leading into it. The party would enter into an entrance area and see a big deep pit going down to darkness. From there, they would cross into a room with a rickety bridge. And on that rickety bridge, there would suddenly be a point where a bunch of beetles would start attacking them. After the rickety bridge room, there'd be another room where they would have to fight. Let's see here. What was it at the time? It was uh, a really big troll, you know, kind of knuckle dragon type. Yeah, that looks like a troll. And a bunch of his little skeleton underlings. How did a troll get skeleton underlings? You'd have to go back in time and ask that fool who was playing D&D &D for the very first time in his life. After this, the party would go up into another room. And in here, there would be a ghost. Ooh, spoopy. And the ghost would possess one of them and make them all fight one of their uh, teammates before they would have to grab a key. And once they had grabbed the key, they then had to go all the way back over the pit, through the locked door, and into the throne room, where there would be a guy there. A guy with magic, who they would then fight. All in all, a very simple design, obviously. Uh, and very nonsensical in certain ways. And clearly just me making... Uh, a room, and then an interesting room with a bridge, and some beetles, and then a, a room with a troll, and some skeletons, and then there's a ghost! It was, I think, a really quick dungeon that we ended up getting through in an evening. Uh, when they got into the throne room, I had such a hard time figuring out how spells work. And so, I don't think that fight lasted long at all, because the wizard had, like, almost no health. Well, there's your explanation for the underlings. A wizard did it. Yep, sure, that's, that's definitely what I was thinking at the time. And so, this was my very first version of this dungeon. However, years later, I began a campaign I was imagining to be a very long-form campaign. Something with three people that were going to be placed into a very unique setting. In this world, I decided on a different premise to kind of explain some things in Dungeons & Dragons. Because this world saw heroes, adventurers, that type of person, as a very specific type of job. A job that kings and mayors, basically important people, could award points for. Basically, I wanted to make a world that almost mm, tried to play with the rules of D&D &D as it was. Where certain hero groups would have basically awarded points that would make them a certain rank of adventurer, essentially. So the more quests you went on for certain people or for like mayors and kings and people like that, 
they would allow your adventuring group to rank up which would have people see you as more important it would allow you access to more places and to go on more adventures but an important thing for early adventurers is to actually get jobs you need some experience you need to have some level of rank so some people started to just make dungeons that's right there would be people in the world who would create dungeons of different difficulties that adventurers could basically go through like practice like training to become stronger and if people would clear a dungeon then what would happen let's see here let's see if i have his name here the healy is nothing uh not that right uh this basically they could award points and be brought up to a higher rank however in my world i made it a very interesting character the character of helius Nathrek. someone who was meant to be a dungeon creator helius Nathrek is a 38-year-old aspiring dungeon designer. He specializes in taking old memoirs and documents of dungeons and combining them into his creations. He began designing in his early 20s, working for the famed Lord of Dungeons. Helius eventually split ways as he found the lord's dungeons to be too forgiving too flowery when compared to the real things his designs were always meant to include lessons to future heroes and the hopes that he can help them survive in a real situation helius however has never received the seal of a true dungeon designer. He has a tendency to overfocus on small details or never even finish major ones. He often cares very little for the adventurers who enter his dungeons unprepared, being quoted as saying, if they die in a beginner's dungeon, their buddies are better off. That's right. Helius Nafarek was meant to be a uh, somewhat self-obsessed, very work-obsessive sociopath in many ways. A character who was making unregistered dungeons in a world, meant to teach people an important lesson, but were filled with unsanctioned monsters, traps unfair puzzles and where he expected people to die in training dungeons that he would mark as for beginners the way helius saw it that sort of training was the best thing for any sort of party member and so through helius I decided to take another crack at my initial dungeon design. Let's see, is it is it training dungeon? Yes, it is. Oh, is that Natharak? That's or Natharak. That's him right here. Love this boy. Anyway, as you can see, the dungeon kept a lot of its early designs, having an entrance hall. And you see kind of this weird room off to the side that seems to be some sort of storage room. I wasn't sure exactly what I was thinking of this at the time. But I just kind of had a little storage room off to the side. Then through the main doors, the party would come into the central hall. Where there would be a large gap going down. And behind that, a locked door leading into the throne room. 
It's my birthday, so I've been a bit busy. Missed the first part of the stream. Oh, that's all right, Barty Grade. You're always free to go back and get story time. But today we're just talking about a dungeon I designed. Next up, the hallway would continue. There would be the rickety bridge here. And right here was the door to the room that I had beetles inside. Again, there was no reason for there to be beetles here. But that's where Helius came in. And I decided to simply start building this place a little like how an insane person would make it. Adding in things at random spots. Splitting hallways in half for no apparent reason. And just making a confusing, looping mess of a dungeon. Which comes to the very first type of trap that I just placed throughout this. Initially, before they started disabling some of them, I just put a dozen stealth bear traps on the ground in random spots throughout this dungeon. It started to become a meme as the party pushed through it for me to randomly say, Yeah, could you make a dexterity saving throw? What? Yeah, bear trap closes around your leg and you take this much damage. The party would push up and I would have multiple side rooms. These rooms would normally have, like, a large monster of one kind or another, along with all the food that monster would need to stay alive. So if they came into this room, this was the room with the troll. Yeah. And so the troll was in this room. And he would fight the party, and if they opened this chest, they would find it full of rotting meat that the troll had been eating. After all, Helius wanted them to basically just stay in that room for a while, and the troll agreed for a large amount of food. <laughs> oh yeah, traps. That's why the person with the most HP always goes first. So the party would go down the hall where there's a bunch more traps, and then they would arrive here. And then in this room, I don't even remember what the monster was in here, but there was another, like, large bestial monster in here with another treasure chest that was just full of rotting food and no actual treasure for the party. When they went over here, as you can see, this room was filled with spiders and a lot of bear traps. And so the party would have to push through these spider webs that would catch them up. And if they pushed to the back, they would find two treasure chests. But again, one of the treasure chests was just full of live flies and rotting food that was meant to feed the spiders. The other one inside of it, I believe, had a note that written on it said, Reward for Beating Spiders. And then finally, they would push into the room with all the skeletal creatures that would fight them. Let's see here. Then there was a let's see here. then there was an actual room with a treasure chest in it. And this room also had a treasure chest in it. But the only thing in these two chests were keys. Because once the party had gotten the two keys that they needed, they would end up having to go back this direction, get over to this door where there was another bear trap located. And then they would place the two keys into the door. And once they had both keys placed in, the door would unlock and swing open into the throne room. And there, they would face the evil necromancer in charge. And perhaps receive the rewards. As you could see, this place was built by a very vindictive type character. Someone who made things as winding and unnecessarily complicated as possible. Filled with so many fake treasure chests that it would come to a point that honest adventurers would probably leave. The monsters were nonsensical and obviously just placed there by somebody, which was sort of the energy I wanted the place to have. And it would just get to the point that once the party would get into the throne room, 
I wanted them to be somewhat exhausted, just a little frustrated, and entirely ready to fuck the shit out of whatever major monster was leading the place. Wandering monsters? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> But as you can see, this dungeon design really only works in that setting I had created. This sort of a place makes a lot of sense in a world where people are designing dungeons to test adventurers. And when made by a character like Helios, a dungeon designed to be frustrating kind of works in a way. I made sure it was, like, exciting to fight monsters. While the bear traps were obnoxious, they only did, like, 1d6 damage. But it was just something that was in character meant to basically just be draining on players. Just, like, where players would have a lot of fun with a bunch of different monsters, a bunch of different traps, rooms with, with like, stupid, obvious riddles in them. But the characters would have to be played as getting more and more frustrated as they went. So then, as those of you who are aware, in my latest setting, my latest campaign, the world doesn't work like that. The world is a lot more grounded in sort of a historical context. So I couldn't make, like a system of training dungeons for people, at least not in this same way. You could obviously have old abandoned ruins that are treated as a place for people to train their dungeoneering skills, but not like something where people gather monsters and put them in a place. But I wanted the dungeon to keep as much of, his, of its initial energy as possible. So I spent a lot of time digging through D&D &D lore, wondering if there is anyone who did something like this. A type of character that is somewhat insane, to the point that they could actually try to build a dungeon. And if I could find that, then I could see if I could actually slot something like this into a one-shot my actual world. I enjoy the caravan to starting town entrance. Okay. And then I found a rather famous character I'm surprised I didn't think of. Someone well-known in D&D lore. A lich by the name of Acererak. Famous for his interconnected massive tombs filled with traps, riddles, and other things that would run amok through adventuring groups. Almost like he was trying to tempt adventurers into a dungeon to have them kill. Now, I didn't want to run my party through the Tomb of Annihilation. I wanted to run them through the Tomb of Helios Nothrake. So, the first step for me was to make the character who would do this. I had to get rid of my well-meaning character of Elias Nothrake. He just wanted people to become better adventurers and would always reward gold and points to anyone who could beat his, his sort of thing. He was callous and unfeeling in many ways, but he was mostly meant to be a very jovial character. And if I was going to combine him with a Sararak, he couldn't be quite so jolly. At least, not in a sensible way. And so I came up with the idea of Helios Natharak. A simple character, a very, very old wizard, one who lived through a time called the Age of Heroes. You see, Helios Natharak is not a lich, 
After all, in the world of Deorum, lichdom does not exist. Not yet. A very important wizard by the name of Vecna is currently looking into that in my world. But that's not where he is yet. So, our character of Natharak has no reason to try and protect a phylactery in a long winding tomb. Plus, I wanted my dungeon to still hold an air of being made by someone trying to train adventurers. So, the only way I could do this was to redouble on the insanity of Elias, the vindictive callousness of a lich, and the insane energy that Helius had combined into the new character, Helius Natharak. You see, Helius Natharak, after living through the Age of Heroes, watching the end of that time, watching the last heroes die off from the Empire of Light, did not understand there should always be heroes in the world he knew the heroes would return they would be important powerful they would save the world from whatever the next big threat is whether that's the vampires of Ascrostia, the march of the dark south of baron verdon or some other great power like what brought the sundering to the world Natharak knew the heroes would have to come. They would have to be found. They would have to be tested. And Natharak would find these heroes. And he knew just where to look. In the ruins of the Empire of Light after its fall, many ancient buildings began to sink below the sand of time. One such place became what was called a training dungeon. It was simply an old storage ruin from the height of the Empire of Light's time. Made from stone, built partially underground, this structure would allow people to move through it and see the sensible dangers of dungeoneering. No monsters lived in it. It was so frequented by up-and-coming treasure hunters that nothing could ever settle in such a place for long, and so no major beasts resided there. Instead, one could learn the dangers of stalactites and stalagmites, of unstable structure, of getting lost in a place where other people frequent enough so that you could eventually find your way back out without being life-threatening. Or you could get a feel for the architecture of the time that most of the explored ruins was like. This was the safest ruin in all of the abandoned empires of light. And so, when rumors began that people were not coming back from expeditions there, curiosity ensued. So is there a difference between adventurers and heroes? Does a party become heroes after a certain time or level? Pretty much what I would say is the age of heroes was just a time at the height of a certain Empire of Light's power. The Empire of Light believed in a pantheon purely of the lawful good gods. And so the main like heroes of their time generally had blessings from the gods uh, some of the more famous ones were known to fight dragons on their own. Basically, the ability to solo slay a full-grown adult dragon would probably be enough to get someone labeled as a hero instead of an adventurer. But that's not exactly how Natharak saw it. Natharak believed a hero was something very special. A hero existed before. They did something, but they existed to do that thing. 
for Natharak, a hero is like someone from an epic or a tragedy. Someone who is destined or fated to change the world in some way. To bring people together, to defeat a major threat, to shift the world, to cause great change through their force of will and powers. And Nathrak believes that the heroes have to be found. The thing is, he doesn't remember why anymore. He spent nearly 200 years trying to find the heroes, trying to cause a new age of heroes to happen, to the point that he has begun to forget any of the reasoning behind it. I mean, you don't really need a reason, right, to find the heroes of time. They're, this age is heroes, of course you'd want to find them. They're important. They are, they're going to save the world from something. You just have to find the heroes, then find the problem, and they'll solve it. Because that's what a hero is. Trapped in this cyclical mindset, in this slowly warping further and further and further out of reality, Natharak would find himself building something, a way to find the heroes and to filter out simple adventurers. He would find himself roaming through the deserts of the once great empire of light, finding abandoned ruins, going inside and seeing what they held, grabbing the treasures, the creatures, everything inside, when it clicks for him. How to find a hero. And so Nathrak begins reshaping the ancient ruins. He begins capturing or bartering with monsters. Ogres, trolls, goblins, and naga. Anything that he can bend with his immeasurable magic abilities or with simple temptation. He leads them into these old ruins and gives them jobs or rooms to guard. Then he begins creating tests, ways to see what a hero's metal is like, ways to measure their goodness, their heroic abilities, their intelligence, their metal. Once he finishes creating his first dungeon, he realizes, well, that's, that's not enough. An adventurer can beat one place by luck or numbers alone. A hero needs more than that. And so Nathra begins roaming the great ruined lands and begins reshaping more dungeons more ruins into massive tests. To keep them straight in his head, he begins labeling them with numbers. 6, 7, 21, 13, 5, 2. The numbers were never made in order, but he never repeated them either. It wasn't until Natharak stood before this training dungeon that it finally clicked what he needed to do. And so on the door into this place, he painted a massive one and wrote the beginnings of a new place. Then he began crafting a map, a map he would place somewhere in this dungeon that would guide whoever beat it to the second dungeon. And inside there, they would find the map to the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, 
10th, 15th, 20th. Natharak did not know how many dungeons were needed to find the hero. But surely, only the heroes of this age would be able to find every dungeon, beat all of them in order, and then find Natharak so that he might know who the heroes are. So here you can see kind of how I started building the dungeon in this world's design. This was meant to be an old ruined place. A simple entrance hall here with an attached storage room. Something that was carried over from this very first place. However, as they push forward, we get straight into the intrigue. For here, Natharak had removed the floor and the ground below that, creating a deep cavern. Immediately as the party passes through, they will be faced with the intrigue of what lies beyond. Then would come the first riddle and puzzle as the party would cross the rickety bridge to arrive at a single solitary stone for them to rest. Here, well, there would be beetles once again. An homage to Helius and his past insanity and a reminder that Natharak is not all together sane. Pushing past, the party would arrive at the place of skeletons. Simple, yet deadly. With two doors along the walls. One to test your intelligence. Another to test your brawn. Before the party would push upwards again. Into the final hallway. Here, there would once more be traps to avoid it, rooms to be faced, and a final puzzle with two different keys. Once retrieved, the party would be able to return to the throne room, make their way in, and face the final boss. Here you can see, I think, very much so, how a lot of this got rechanged, where this whole area now, instead of being these like a room, well, let's get a better, more obvious color here. This was no longer a room, a hallway, a hallway, a room, which honestly, if you think of kind of how a space of design doesn't make sense anymore, it has been shifted into basically adjoining rooms, all sort of connecting to a major hallway. That goes upwards and then outwards. Then we get into a space where all of this had essentially been combined into one room with adjoining rooms. Something to keep things simpler, more refined in a way, to feel like an actual building. Because, remember, Natharak is no longer building this from scratch like Helius did with the initial dungeon. He is going into existing ruins and structures and converting them. So these building layouts, I wanted to make sense. The building itself should be sensible, should be like you're exploring a ruin. It should be everything that's been painted over it. That should be filled with an air of insanity. So what was once this confusing collection of rooms, looping hallways, has become something different entirely. Yeah, welcome to uh, the names of a lot of my uh, D and D campaigns I've made in the past. Don't mind those too much. Let's see here. Oh no, that's wrong. 
I'm looking for dungeon delving for idiots. And so now I begin my fourth and final, well, for now, perhaps final is too much, my fourth rendition of this dungeon where I wanted to take things how they were and convert it into something massive. Now, while this might look to be of a similar size to kind of the single map we had before, I think that's for a very simple reason. This map, by scale, let's see here, is 120 by 75. Meanwhile, the individual rooms in my larger version of the dungeon were 25 by 25. That's right. While this dungeon looks small when it's zoomed out, the actual tile size lets you know what I'm doing here. I'm making a single map that will encompass every room, essentially, of the last design of the dungeon, and will allow me to begin seeing some very interesting things. I realized as soon as I was going into it that I had to redesign a lot of the hallways here, because how big rooms used to be when I had it just room by room by room didn't make sense for the scale of the structure. Here you can see, like, this design is almost torn exactly from, uh, let's see if I can get there. Yeah, so you can see kind of how this design is laid out, and how it's very similar to this, but where here I'm able to cheat a bit. I'm able to say, okay, here's this gap, then here's the second gap, which goes off screen, so that when you get to here, I get to say, yeah, off screen gap to here, and here are the rooms. When I'm actually building it now, now that that gap needs to actually be reflected in the other rooms, it entirely changes the scale of how everything needs to be designed for. And so it has been absolutely fascinating to go back through a dungeon that was designed room by room and start to realize how much of it just doesn't quite actually makes sense and so where before i thought i could simply rip these rooms stick them together and have a new dungeon i've now begun going through and redesigning things again certain elements are easy enough to leave in place while others begin to raise new questions what to do with Let's see here. This hallway, which seemed to go straight up from the room below in sort of a vertical manner, when you realize you actually have a lot more horizontal space. So instead of being a purely vertical hallway, you now decide to use it in a more horizontal orientation. What does that change about this space, about this one? What do I do here now that I actually have three interconnected rooms instead of the previous two? How else do I have to redesign? I'm just imagining a group going through this increasingly tedious encounter, opening the door to the next and basically being told, great, I'm just doing it again. <laughs> yeah, no, that's definitely a big thing. So, what I will say is I'm going to avoid giving away any of the riddles I used during this version of the dungeon, because quite a few of them I think are very good, I'm very proud of, and I might end up using here again. But if you want to try to take advantage of this time, go ahead and try to copy out this floor layout and see if you'll be able to use it for whoever ends up going into our one shot because this floor layout is unlikely to change much but like i said there are still some redesigning questions i'm having to answer 
in my latest edition of this dungeon. But also, we have five minutes left before the end of stream. So if there's any uh, suggestions, questions, or anything else you have, this might be an opportunity for those of you here today to mess with the one shot in the future. Ah, and thank you, Lotus. I will get hydrated. How do you come up with people and location names? So people and locations, I think I tend to name very in very different styles. Uh, people, for one thing, uh, if they're just NPCs, they don't tend to get a lot of thought, actually. Uh, when I build regions in my worlds, they're almost always based off of historical regions. So I'm always able to just grab historical names. Uh, for example, in Tiverfia, where you've come across names Ivan, Frederick, uh, Gregory, those types of names are very obviously pulled from a very, like, Rus sort of inspiration. Because Tiverfia... Pontevi in that region, all these very Russian in sort of their kind of historical inspiration. When it comes to more specific characters, uh, like Helius Nathrek, I know I wanted a couple of things from his name. The first is he was a dungeon designer meant to torture the players. So I made sure to include Eric in letters in his name. And that's where you get Thrake. Nah, Thrake. I also wanted him to have sort of this weird forebodingness to his name. So that's where Helius Nah, Thrake. Sort of just holds a lot of that weird... Oh, shit! Wait, stop her daybreak. It's not going through. One second. I got trigger fire here? Is trigger fire not firing? Hold on. Hold on. Let me... Let me see. No one else redeemed that, y'all. Hold on a second. Shit. Trigger fire's not working. Ah, oh, man. I'm sorry about that, guys. Uh, one second. Let me see if I can if I can refund those, but... Yeah, basically, so for those types of names, that's kind of the, the style I tend to go around when I'm naming things. Locations, I tend to... Name in a very dumb way. For example, uh, I have a major region called Polamont, or the uh, the Republic of Polamont, and I think for that I looked up like old Italian and grabbed words for like military or legion stuff like that. And I constructed basically a name that just sort of translated into uh, like a unified army, which reflected like their their military status and and kind of their their very Romanesque inspirations. Uh, the Empire of Light, I think its name just sort of came from their worship of lawful goods, and then uh, and then, like I have places that are called like. Like, Fort is the location of a city that is just basically of a civilization that's built around a major fortress. And so the city connected to it is just called Fort. Whereas other locales, uh, for example, the capital of the Elven uh, Empire is called Corella, which is named after the main Elven god uh, Corella, or Cor Corel, I believe. And so they named their capital Corella. Just as a, as a as kind of a nod to him, the location names I tend to take a very literal grab from either the civilizations like culture or history, and just sort of make a place that just is named in kind of these very simple ways. Uh, and then when I'm naming characters like NPCs from a region, I kind of take my historical inspirations and run with them. And when I'm naming, like, more specific characters, I tend to look for the energy I'm trying to derive their name. And I'll I'll do a little bit of looking at other languages to see if there's any cool sounds I can pull and combining them into, uh, 
Hmm. Let's hear. Perhaps the doors do not actually connect in an Euclidean manner. For example, though two rooms may be adjacent, the door connecting them could lead to an entirely different area of the dungeon. Very interesting. How about a dungeon where a magic voice sarcastically narrates all of the party's actions? That I'm stealing for another fucking dungeon. Okay. Yep. Nope. That is exactly what happens in Nathrax's 13th tomb. Is there is a voice berating the party the whole time. To see if the heroes can withstand the judgment of the lesser people. Also, permanent looming threat of being attacked by vicious mockery out of the blue at random intervals. That is beautiful. I fucking love that. Yeah. So this is just sort of what I've been working on as I prepare for the subathon on Tuesday. But, 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 y'all. Let's see our first thing. So sh is that in stream manager? Let's see here. Activity feed. Lord, I don't remember how to refund. I might have to look that up afterwards and then get you guys refunded on that. But for now, we'll simply have to try to get kick fixed before the next stream. I'll see what I have to do to get that up and running. But y'all... We're just a couple of days out from the subathon. How are you all feeling? You guys excited? Any last minute requests or things you're hoping to do? Or any questions about what's going to be happening there? I know I've explained it a few times, but uh, really, honestly, I, I didn't know if I could stream today. When I was sitting down and prepping to streaming, I was just like, fuck, there's so much I have to prepare for. I gotta gotta set up all the scenes for, for all the games. I've got like 12 games I gotta play. I gotta make sure I can actually game capture all that. Fucking, how do I wanna do the multiplayer? Uh, do I need to make a new channel so that people can be like voicing in the stream? Do I need voices? And I'm just, I don't know. I'm j I woke up this morning just on edge like in a very happy and excited way but in a i can't calm down sort of way you know i can only imagine the sheer amount of sarcastic comments every time a party fails a puzzle hell yeah sour you know what's fucking up wrong there's only one game you have to play eric sour you seem very confident in your ability to turn everyone into uh voting for slime rancher and while I wish you all the best in achieving that and hope you can pull that off, I don't know if that's a great assumption to have, you know? All right, all right. Well, he's got like five votes. Oh, that is fair. The fucking goths. It's literally the only game worth playing ever. Well, we will see. We will see. I'm most excited to see what you guys do for the dramatic reading redeems. Because I imagine there are more than a couple of things prepared to make that stream as cursed as possible. When exactly is it starting again? All right, so, Waco! In fact, you know what? Let's move ourselves on over. Because we will be ending soon here. You'll see. I will see, Marcial. But let's see. Let me pull up my timer. And what we want is the 23rd. And it will be at 2 p.m. So I believe if I start here. There. There we go. Sorry. This is much better. So there is your timer, everybody. We have two days, 18 hours, and 55 minutes before the subathon 
for those who are curious just for like the time yeah 2 p.m pst exactly Waco. sorry i know i could have labeled this a lot simpler but i wanted to see what the timer would look like <laughs> Come on, you know how to use a calculator. Well, there it is. It's right there for you guys. Anyone wanting to set their own timer can do it, or for people just looking forward to set a date, that'll be Tuesday, the twenty third, at two p a at two p m PST. But but but, with that, I'm afraid we are done for today, and we'll simply have to wait two days. 18 hours before we get into it so i would like to wish you all a good night and send you all off to say hi to a fun little streamer what if eric did a 12-hour stream in 10 hours of it was just starting soon screen oh that'd be fun right everybody would have fun with that <laughs> God damn it, Sour. All right, y'all. Yep, Mortis. Good night. See you soon. And I hope you all are just as fucking giddy for this as I am. Cannot wait. So with that, all I can say is yeet!